welcome to the seminar on Enhancing Brain Function. Uh, as you'll see from the picture here, um, there's a nice colours through the spectrum, from the red end of the spectrum through to the blue. And we're going to be talking quite a lot about colour today and how to stimulate the brain through different wavelengths. Um, so I just want to introduce you to the idea of reversing these. So this second slide is the opposite or complementary colour to the first slide. This is obtained on the computer uh, as a negative uh, or inverted image. And generally, as we'll see, that monochromic colours or single colours as we see them um, can be detrimental to people with certain wavelengths, uh, whereas the complementary colour is the healing or the uh, uh, therapeutic colour, as we'll see. So that I just wanted to introduce you to the idea. It's the same picture, but in just in reverse. So topics we want to discuss today, um, some will be briefer than others, um, but we want to introduce um, some of these subjects which we did in the Memory to Dementia module back in March time. We didn't have the beta amyloid protein at the time as the marker, but we now have got that and everybody will be given a vial of it uh, and its relationship to APOE, which I'm sure most of you have got as the marker. Um, then we're going to look at factors to stimulate brain, uh, exercise, etc., and <coughs> turmeric and other epigenetic factors. And then we're going to look at exercises for each neurotransmitter. So there are ways of stimulating the neurotransmitters through physical exercise and how best to do that. We're going to look at the introduction to diets in helping brain function and uh, reduce the incidence of, amenia, uh, of uh, dementia. Uh, a nutrient list to consider, which is a pricey of all the first seminar that we did on uh, dementia. Um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, body clock, and the definitive meridian, which are the major points of where, how we start looking at a patient. Uh, and then we're going to look at the um, just briefly mention the constitutional three colours, which we're all familiar with, and then introduce the work of Karl Popp, uh, Fritz Popp rather, um, in his uh, study on carcinogens, carcinogen sub substances using 380 nanometers. And we're going to ask the question what it actually means when a person reacts to 380 nanometers. We're going to look at monochromic colours, which means single wavelength of colour, uh, the composites of bringing these all together into into uh, acetates of seven colours, the relationship of these seven colours to reactive oxygen species or free radical production, uh, the effect of hypoxia uh, creating porphyria and other problems and the incidence of uh, eye stress at 400 nanometers. Uh, we're going to look at selenium in its different forms, um, but the major way that the body produces this and the major enzymes that it works on with glutathione peroxidase, deiodinase, and other um, enzymes. Um, the gluten myth and all about Kamut wheat, uh, which is a, an old form of wheat from ancient, ancient Egypt, which is very rich in selenium. Uh, we're going to look at the complementary colors to these seven acetates. Uh, LED light therapy, and especially how it reacts at complex four in the mitochondria. Uh, complementary foods um, to each of the wavelengths. So we'll be looking at the carotenoids on the red, yellow end of the spectrum, which help protect against the blue violet, and then the flavonoids, which are more on the blue to protect against the red, orange end of the spectrum. A patient protocol using the seven biophoto uh, acetates, biophoton acetates, um, and how we implement that in by using eyes into distortion. Uh, the red acetate and its relationship to amino acids and when amino acids are required. And then Jill is going to talk about amino acids and I'm going to talk about a clinical aspect called spectroscope, which we've updated um, using colour for therapy. So that's the topics for today. Uh, markers to consider, very similar markers of course for preventing dementia as would be to enhance brain function. Um, the main one that you'll all be given today is the amyloid beta protein fragment, and this is one particular fragment of the protein complex, which is the one that's used to diagnose when the possibility a person has got dementia or Alzheimer's forming. We, need to, we came to the conclusion in the first seminar that dementia basically is a lack of energy production in the mitochondria in the neurons. We met the fact there were hundreds or thousands, in fact, of mitochondria in a neuron, 
And when the energy level goes down, then the nerve starts to malfunction. And in fact, in the, uh, when, when, we produce, when we have a lack of energy, the nervous system is the first place that you see this. So we measure energy with magnesium ATP as a marker. Uh, we use DNA polymerase to indicate there's a genetic, uh, there's a problem of polymorphism or damage to the DNA, particularly in the mitochondria. And this is a zinc dependent enzyme. So whenever this shows, it means there's uh, reactive oxygen species damage to it and it needs to be rec recover. Uh, CoQ10, uh, complex 3, which is cytochrome C reductase, cytochrome C, which is the complex that takes the electrons from complex uh, 3 to 4. Complex 4, otherwise known as cytochrome C oxidase, which we'll be looking at in a little bit more detail because this is where the free radicals and it all happens inside the mitochondria. Cardiolipin, which is the phospholipid rich in the membrane of the mitochondria. The uh, effect of carbon monoxide in the mitochondria, particularly at complex 4 and cyanide, and the oxidative damage to the uh, phospholipid structures, the oils, with malondaldehyde. So these are our major markers on the energy side. When we look at the gas or oxygen and the lack of that in the mitochondria to produce the energy, we obviously use oxygen as a marker. We use hemoglobin to see whether the issue is that the oxygen isn't being carried by the hemoglobin. We look at the cofactors for making heme as the basis of hemoglobin, ALA, PGG, PBG, uroporphinogen, uh, coproporphinogen, protoporphinogen, and heme itself. Uh, we'll be talking about reactive oxygen species, so it's very important to have the markers which you'll be given or got, which is superoxide and NADP, H, to make superoxide and N, uh, hydrogen peroxide, hypochloride, and nitric oxide. And from those markers, you can then make all the family of the reactive oxygen species, which is uh, how I, I teach it, and the relationship to the different colors associated with the oxygen molecules. For good measure, um, particularly with people who are developing the dementia, and from our point of view, the markers, the most important markers otherwise are homocysteine, which we're familiar with, with the uh, uh, problems with metabolism through to cysteine from methionine, uh, APOE4 as a uh, allele of the APOE um, lipoprotein, uh, and probiotics, which are very important, again, in the gut to stop toxins, particularly things like propionic acid being formed which can go on and create, add to dementia. So we'll start off where we didn't complete last time, which is on beta amyloid protein. And this is a protein which uh, causes uh, fibrillin changes, and but just basically binds the neurons together. So here we see a nerve cell with the uh, nucleus here. We've got deposits of what are called tau protein as we occur there, and deposits of amyloid protein between the dendrites here, which glue it all together. So in 1991, the amyloid hypothesis, and this is only a hypothesis, nobody at this stage knows for sure the cause of uh, Alzheimer's. There's various theories. Um, the only true diagnosis is autopsy, the only valid one. And uh, that's not really a diagnosis as it's too late. But there are various theories and various ideas of what could cause it. But in 1991, I can remember myself when this was announced on the radio, the amyloid hypothesis postulated that extracellular amyloid beta protein are the fundamental cause of the disease. Well, this, as we see, of course, is not the cause. It's a result that goes on then to clog the neurons up from functioning. But it doesn't answer why it occurs in the first place. Support for this comes from the location of the gene for the amyloid precursor protein on chromosome 21 which is exactly the same one as in Down syndrome. And the majority of Down syndromes who have an extra gene copy almost universally exhibit Alzheimer's disease by age 40. Also a specific isoform of apolipoprotein called apolipoprotein E4 is a major genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, let's just remind ourselves that apolipoprotein is a protein uh, that takes cholesterol and other fragments, cholesterol fragments, and heavy metals away from the system, away from the cell, uh, especially when the cholesterol's been oxidized, to the liver to detoxify. So it's like a cleaning factory. And at, at certain locations in the APOE4 structure, or APOE structure, which is made of amino acids, chains of many hundreds of amino acids long, um, in the APOE2, we have two molecules along there of cysteine, which is a sulfur-bearing amino acid, 
and sulfur has a valency, as we know, of two, four, and six. So it has arms which can reach out for holding onto chemicals and toxic metals. APOE3 has one molecule of cysteine and one molecule of arginine, which is an amino acid that doesn't have sulfur within it, so it has less detoxifying potency. Whereas APOE4 has two molecules of arginine, so there's no cysteine in this particular location, which means it's much less um, efficient at detoxifying cholesterol fragments and heavy metals. So this predisposes it to a number of different disorders. So whilst apolipoproteins enhance the breakdown of beta amyloid, so in other words, the APOE, uh, APOE2 and to some extent 3, but not 4. So whilst apolipoproteins enhance the breakdown of beta amyloid, some isoforms are not very effective, i.e. the APOE4, leading to excess amyloid buildup in the brain. So it looks as though the beta amyloid is secondary to the lack of the APOE, the correct allele here. So if you've got a, a predisposition to APOE4 expression, we need to do something about it. So APOE4 is a very, very important marker. And we know that by um, constitutionally, red people who are in the middle sort of build, between 5 at 5 and 5 at 7 on the female side, 5, 6 to 5, 8 roughly in the, in the male, um, are blessed with the APOE4 allele. Uh, this doesn't seem to occur in green people or blue people, so it is the red type of body constitution who really must take care at this stage to do everything they can nutritionally to epigenetically upregulate APOE4. <coughs> and we'll see during Jill's talk later on this afternoon that this can be done very effectively by using amino acids. So in this case, I've told you that APOE4 tends to have two molecules of arginine in a particular location, Whereas by substituting, and we'll see how well this comes about, cysteine into there and flooding the body with more cysteine, this acts as a detoxifier to support the short straw that you've got of the APOE4. Right, so further evidence comes from the finding that transgenic mice, these are ones which have been injected with mutations that express a mutant form of human APP, uh, develop fibrillar amyloid plaques and Alzheimer-like brain pathology with spatial learning deficits. The tau hypothesis it proposes that tau protein abnormalities initiate the disease cascade. In this model, hyperphosphorylated tau begins to pair with other threads of tau. Eventually, they form neurofibrillary tangles inside the nerve cell bodies. So basically, it's like a darning um, uh, thread uh, locking up and tying all the, uh, the cell mechanism together. When this occurs, the microtubules disintegrate, destroying the structure of the cell cytoskeleton. We know there's little tubules inside the uh, cell itself which transmit information from the cell membrane to the nucleus uh, and to the various organelles inside. But what's interesting here, um, the cytoskeleton which collapses, the neurons transport system, can also be the effect of mercury toxicity. The mercury toxicity seems to mimic exactly what this is about, which is interesting, <laughs> because mercury toxicity wouldn't be something that would be considered as a possible cause of Alzheimer's disease, or certainly admitted because of the fear of litigation here. We know, on the other hand, that this is primarily to do with red people, or not exclusively, but more to do with the red constitution type, which have a strong affinity towards aluminium. And they have found a lot of aluminium, a high density of aluminium in the brains on autopsy of people with Alzheimer's disease. But we don't know whether the aluminium is just not being detoxified and is rich in the brain because the brain is a, uh, is a fatty substance and is stored in the fat, or whether it's the actual cause of it. But we know that red people have problems eliminating aluminium, but we don't know whether aluminium actually is what causes these neurofibrillary tangles to occur. This may result in malfunctions in biochemical communication between neurons and later death in the cells. So would I suggest a person has mercury out of the teeth um, and other sources of mercury looked at um, who've got Alzheimer's, most definitely, or getting dementia. So if any of you are beginning to have problems with memory, which is probably why you're here in the first place, um, I would look very carefully at the teeth. Um, but the teeth is no longer the biggest source of mercury. So bigger sources of mercury, the biggest for most people, is fish, and particularly fish oil, of course. So fish oil itself is a concentrated source of, um, of different fatty acids stored in the body, um, in the flesh of the fish, not fish liver. We know liver, fish liver is obviously going to be fairly concentrated in dioxin and mercury, 
But fish liver oil is very concentrated and may have inevitably, in spite of all the centrifuging and cleaning up, a minute fragment of mercury, which is not a problem generally to green and blue, uh, green and red people. But for blue people, they're unable to detoxify mercury, so they store it. <coughs> and where do you store a toxin? You store it in the fat, just like the fish does. So the mercury doesn't kill the fish, it just stores it, and then it kills us when we eat it. Yeah. So that's how toxins generally occur. So would I suggest you have the amalgams out? <coughs> yes, um, but remember the problem is not so much the amalgams at this particular time, it's the mercury that's got into the system, and that can take years. If you remember, the half-life of mercury in the blood, in the body here, is 72 days, half-life, but in the brain it's 27 years. So once you get it in the brain, even when you have all the mercury removed, it's very difficult, unless you use chelating uh, nutrients and products, to be able to get it out of the brain. You know, I have people, colleagues, who've told me that they've had it out, that they've shown up mercury in the urine, even though they've had their teeth done many, many years ago, and wondered where it come from. The other source of mercury is corn syrup. Corn syrup is particularly high, which is more of a problem in the US than it is here, although we are using increasing amounts of corn syrup. Um, it's to do with the pesticide that they use on the corn. It a has, a, has a high degree of mercury in it. So we may have to look away from just the teeth um, as a source of mercury. Uh, memory loss leading to Alzheimer's degenerative changes begin in the hippocampus which starts to shrink. So short-term memory is affected first. So it's the reason why you go into the room and then you forget what you've gone in the room for. Okay, that's the short-term memory. Um, but you can remember the big events of your childhood um, much more clear. The brain loses its plasticity. This is its ability, the plasticity we talk a lot about, the ability to adapt and find new neuronal circuits and relive old ones, re re-enliven old ones. And its ability to make connections between the neurons, in other words, for the nerves to talk, many of which uh, deteriorate and die. So how would we use the APO, the, the beta amyloid? So very simply, Jill, if you could borrow your uh, amyloid. Jill? Right, who would like to be a model? Okay, let's have you, Jaron. You're a bit worried? Always. Okay, so very simply, obviously, um, we would um, do a workup first of all. Pop yourself down with your head up there. We do a workup, and we'll talk about that this afternoon when we look at how we look at patients. Um, so we would look at things like uh, the different constitutional colors. Um, we would look at their, their body clock is set all right, and that their left and right subconscious emotions are working fine. So everything is working absolutely tip-top. We then take a strong indicator muscle. We use a rectus femoris here, but we can use any muscle. Um, the popular one in kinesiology is, of course, the supraspinatus. But this is a muscle which it doesn't take very much to overpower it at the best of times unless a person does a lot of training. So just pull your knee to your shoulder. And on the tummy, we'll use the, the vial. These vials, as I've explained before, have got um, charcoal, activated charcoal in them as the uh, medium for taking the uh, frequency of the substance. So pull. So a very daring move here by the patient uh, to be put on film to see whether they weaken the beta amyloid protein. So my advice here is that you don't tell the patient when you do this. You just do it as a routine, a part of your testing, and uh, don't try and explain what it is, except for the fact that if they go weak at this stage, obviously anything that in kinesiology that goes weak means it's detrimental to the person. So pull again, just to make absolutely sure. And we'll test on the other side to make sure that both legs are nice and strong, which would indicate the crossover to the left and the right brain. So you're very good. Okay, thank you. We'll have you back later. Um, so what would we do about it then? Um, the same thing as we'll do this afternoon. What, how I start with people is to use that as the marker and then put the eyes into distortion. So I would take the eyes into distortion in the, in the way left and right for the energy, as we'll see later on. Uh, and then I would go round and round for infections, and then I go down to the right for allergy, left to toxins, and so on. And this is your quickest way to know in there, because all we know is he's getting problems, perhaps, with that beta amyloid protein, which is not being shunted away to the liver and detoxified by the APOE, because he's got perhaps the APOE4 expression. Okay? 
So we need to find out all the nutrients and things that can upregulate and increase or improve epigenetically the APOE expression. So cysteine might be one of the amino acids that we consider there because that's the amino acid pair that is missing. Okay. So let's go on and have a look at... Uh, what have I done here? Decline occurs in the brain function <coughs> for a number of reasons. Um, learned non-use. This means that we learn, as we'll see, not to use parts of our brain. We may have a noisy brain or dysrhythmia. This is when the brain is chattering away and nerves are firing away when we don't want them to. Uh, and the absence of rapid formation of neuronal assemblies, every mental act creates different networks. So there was a lack of stimulation. So the most impressive protection, let's go, just go back to this one again. The learned non-use we'll come on to in a minute because this is very common after traumatic brain injury and strokes. Uh, the noisy brain, we'll see we can modulate this. This is mostly an imbalance between the autonomic nervous systems. And the absence of rapid formation in neuronal assemblies is a lack of stimulation. So the most impressive protection from cognitive decline was found to be, and the surprising one here was exercise. So exercise was the most important thing. So walking, um, we've got various um, opinions on this as to the distance. And we'll talk about that later on as to what is the best distance for people. But exercise walking two miles a day or bicycling 10 miles a day. So do you walk 10 miles a day? Or, or two, two miles a day or cycle 10 miles a day? Number two, a healthy diet, whatever that means. I get a lot of patients who come in and say, my diet's very good. <laughs> I say, oh, okay. <laughs> and then you find they're hideously deficient in B12 because they don't eat any meat um, and they become a vegetarian. And you think, ah, oh, maybe they do need some uh, meat or certainly to take B12, et cetera. So what people's definition of a healthy diet is often different from other people's. It's an individual. Normal body weight, low alcohol. Again, we talk about alcohol uh, and no smoking. So walking reduces the risk of dementia by 60%. Um, I can always remember years ago when I lived in a village, you'd see an old man for years riding a bicycle. He was a gardener, and he seemed to go on for years and years and years. And every time I then left that village and went back, he was still riding his bike. <laughs> you, know, you probably will come across people like that. Um, they usually have an old-fashioned bike with handlebars like that, and they potter at no speed at all but he probably does his 10 miles uh, every day. So walking reduces the risk of dementia by 60%. Research showed at Cardiff University, followed several thousand men aged between 40 and 60, or 59, testing them every five years for 30 years. So walking reduces the risk by 60%. Aerobic exercise, where we're increasing our pulse rate, and generally we call aerobic exercise 180 minus your age. This is the maximum aerobic pulse. So if you're 50, uh, it's 180 minus 50, which gives you 130, would be your maximum aerobic pulse in a minute. Okay, so if you go above that, you're then working anaerobically, which means you're switching off your Krebs cycle and working more by glycolysis. So aerobic exercise, in other words, putting some effort into the heart, but not too much. And turmeric. Turmeric are the best epigenetic modulators of brain neurogenesis, which means the stimulation of new brain cells. So we know, and research has shown in more recent years, that neurogenesis does exist. Uh, even though it's not at anywhere near the rate of degeneration, but it does exist. And if we can do anything that will stimulate this, and what they found is that turmeric in high concentration uh, is one of the best ways of stimulating it. The problem, the downside of it is, that nine-tenths of turmeric isn't absorbed. So if you take turmeric just as the raw spice, it does tend to mostly upset the gut in the amount that you need. You'd need several tablespoons, probably. Um, but first of all, they started adding things which would enhance the absorption, like pepper or pepper in the extract was in there. Uh, and then uh, boswellia or frankincense improved that. And we find that black cumin seed or nigella seed is the most efficient as far as we're concerned. We only need a very small amount there on a regular basis, maybe one, two, three, four capsules, and uh, this has the effect 
of at least double or triple the number of capsules that you would need of a pure fill turmeric. So turmeric with black cumin seed reduces the incidence down enormously. Turmeric is also, um, as we'll see, a yellow to orange compound. Um, particularly we found that the only ones that really work in this case are organic. And organic tend to have more of an orangey tinge to them. When they lose those oils, they go more yellow. So when you see turmeric yellow, it's probably old and it's lost a lot of the volatile oils in it. And probably a lot of the good has gone as well. So organic is very important. And we'll see that this also protects very much in the yellow, being yellow-orange, it, it protects against the blue and the violet lights. And it's the blue-violet end of the spectrum which is associated, as we'll see, with the more reactive reactor oxygen species like peroxynitrite. So it's one of the best protectors you can do for brain function is to take turmeric and, as we'll see, other yellow-orange foods if you've got this problem with on the blue end of the spectrum. So we know that blue end of the spectrum affects the eyes, but it also affects the rest of the body very much, um, particularly when it's associated with these reactive oxygen species like, like peroxynitrate. So remember aerobic exercise and turmeric. When to take turmeric? Probably as a capsule, you can take it any time, um, but it's nice to actually put into food. You know, it's not the favorite of spices, but on the other hand, you can easily put it into anything which you're cooking. Um, I personally put it into mayonnaise. When I make mayonnaise, I put a couple of capsules of it in there. So you can put it into many, many different foods and, and take it. But it is worth taking um, on a long-term basis if, as you'll see, you have a problem with the blue end of the spectrum. And if you're a red person body constitution and have a problem with APOE4. So exercise has been shown to stimulate different growth uh, compounds in the brain. Uh, the two most measured is the glial-derived neurotrophic factor. This obviously stimulates the production of glial cells. And the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, which stimulate new brain, cell, brain cells and connections. But I just wanted to put in there that um, most of the research on neurogenesis has been done with birds, because birds are the only animal that regenerates its brain every year. So every 12 months, it has a totally new brain. The problem is, does it remember what it did last year? <laughs> so is the memory stored within the neurons or the holographic neuronal connection, or is the memory somewhere else? Because otherwise, the bird wouldn't remember where its nest was for last year, as birds have amazing powers of memory if they regenerate their brain. And of course, the, the answer is, what do birds eat that does this? Do they eat turmeric? Not, not really, do they? They eat seeds, a lot of seeds, and a lot of worms. So maybe the secret's in, this, in the worms. <laughs> um, anyway, we, we have to learn by what the animals do. So those are the two major neurotrophic factors which are studied. Increasing running, increased running and environmental enrichment. This means plenty of things to do around in your environment. Reduces the loss of acetyl choline and dopamine cells. So the two most important, or the most important with memory recall, as we learned last time, is acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is involved with the recall of the memory. The laying of the memory down, if you remember, the input was related to the five senses, which were excitatory neurotransmitters, like glutamate, and the actual burning of the hard disk, or the laying of the dendrites down, making those connections, was stimulated under the guidance of dopamine. So therefore, acetylcholine and dopamine are the real cells which we study. And we can do this very well with our applied kinesiology techniques using the beginning and ending points. So smaller stresses prepare the body for greater stresses and stimulate growth, such as walking fast and breaking a sweat. So these are good stimulation to the body. They prepare it for stress without actually going into the stress state. So walking fast is good and breaking a sweat is good. But obviously prolonged stress for the body is bad and leads to neuronal loss, mainly because it stimulates cortisol, which can damage the hippocampus, particularly the neurons there, and lead to loss of memory. Most growth through the exercise, etc., is in the hippocampus. So this seems to be the key point, um, focal point around where memory goes into, um, and uh, uh, like a rheostat, um, 
if our hippocampus is working fine, then our memory recall is good. So the hippocampus that turns short-term memories into long-term memories, and in the basal ganglion, especially the striatum. Exercises increases learning, proportional to the rise in brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor. A combination of learning and exercise maintains the plasticity of the brain. So now we've got learning is important because it stimulates the brain, and we've got exercise. Now what happens if we put the two together? So it's all right, I won't get you to all get up and jump around. Anybody do a Tony Robbins seminar years ago, which is what he tends to do with it. And it's a great way of actually learning. You know, it's fantastic stimulation. But one of the best ways of doing this is just to, when you go out for your walk or your run, is to stick your headphones up and not just listen to music, but you can listen to uh, something more academic. And it's a very, very good way of learning. My children, you know, can't believe that. When I go out for a run and they say, what music are you listening to, Dad? And I said, well, actually, I'm listening to Jeff Bland's Functional Medicine Update. <laughs> and they sort of smile, and I say, well, have a listen. And they say, whoa, what are you doing that for? And I say, because I learn that way. What, when you run? So I said, yes. And if you think about it, when you run, what do you do? You exercise your muscles, don't you? Your voluntary muscles are contracting. And what is the neurotransmitter of the voluntary muscles? Acetylcholine, isn't it? So when you stimulate acetylcholine, by physically running, you stimulate it in the brain as well. Because it's exactly the same receptors, the nicotinic receptors in the brain for the memory recall, as on the neuromuscular junctions. So exercise is very, very good. And as we'll see, there's one particular exercise which is probably better than running when you're trying to learn things. But we'll come on to that when we look at the neurotransmitters. So, combination of learning and exercise, very, very important here. So you can begin to think, well, this could be actually adapted at school really well. So it's very, very important that children do a lot of sports, isn't it? And exercise at school. When I was at school, we used to have sport at least a couple of days a week, a couple of times a week, and certainly gym at least a couple of times a week. Now in some of the schools, it's, uh, it's voluntary whether they even do it, or they can opt out and do art classes or something else instead. But physical exercise is very, very important in the learning process. Learning turns on, the learning turns on genes that express more glial-derived neurotrophic factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor, facilitated learning. So basically, the more you learn, the better you become at learning. Okay? So the more seminars you do, the better it is. It okay? doesn't have to be just epigenetic seminars, but they're the best ones, of course, to come to. Okay, so a sedentary lifestyle is a significant risk factor to memory loss. Heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So that's the original couch potato. Now you've seen them. So exercise actually becomes more important, therefore, as we age and not less. So we always think about exercise at school, and when we get a bit older, we play a little bit of sport till we're in our 20s, and then we start getting injuries and things, and then we pack it all up. Um, but actually, as we get older, we need to maintain exercise and increase it. And certainly, as we'll see, the resistance exercise as we get older, it becomes more and more important. So learned non-use uh, occurs due to a lack of stimulation and exercise. So people learn not to use themselves or to stimulate their brain. This is seen in people who've had strokes and traumatic brain injury. And we'll come back to people with strokes and traumatic brain injury of how Francis Crick stimulated these uh, using different uh, carbon fiber colors into the brain. People learn not to use bits of their brain that don't work. So in other words, you need to stimulate the brain that doesn't work. You don't need to just leave it and become complacent because it will degenerate. Exercise stops a newly injured system from going down. So the most important thing when a person's had a brain injury is actually to get back to exercising. And the same thing applies with most injuries, is to get back using it because it stimulates the laying down of better uh, collagen and other regenerative tissues. Exercise should be one of the first recommendations made with a person with signs of dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or any other form, um, people should be encouraged to do more. So the worst thing is to decrease activity and just to sit there in a chair all day. Strength training, that's against resistance, is important. Stretching and coordinated movement exercises must be included. Now the strength training, as we'll see, really means pushing against resistance um, a certain number of times to build up the bulk and the firing of the muscle. 
we know that when you fire a muscle, if I lift this bottle, uh, very few fibers in my, in my biceps will actually contract. But if I was to lift you up, most of my fibers would contract there. So the more fibers I can get to contract, the better. Why? Because the more acetylcholine I produce. Okay, the more acetylcholine I have to secrete here, the more fibers I can contract. We know that we don't have to contract all our muscles, but a fiber will contract totally, but not all fibers contract for the movement. Obviously, the greater the, the, uh, the lift that we have to do, the more fibers will contract. And therefore, the more you can contract, the more acetylcholine is produced at the neuromuscular junctions, and therefore, the more acetylcholine will get into the system and stimulate the brain because of the acetylcholine there. So strength training is, is the better way here to stimulate acetylcholine. Stretching and coordinating movements are important as well. So walking, now we get this other report that says that walking three times a week is good, but for a greater time. So for two, 45 minutes each time should be the goal. So walking three times a week for 45 minutes. Start with a small amount, and this is important here. Start with a small amount, which will be 10 minutes. However enthusiastic the person is, don't push it too much to begin with. So start with 10 minutes three times a week, and then you each two weeks you build up by 10 minutes or so, and increase by 10 minutes for two weeks. If the person has an injury or an illness, they have to go back to the beginning again. It's a bit like snakes and ladders. Don't go back straight into it, and people tell me that, who've had strokes and things, that they were doing very, very well, and then something happened, and they were off because they got flu, and they expected to go back and be able to achieve the same amount, and they can't do it. So start off small and build back up. That's very, very important for the plasticity of the brain. Now, we don't know that exercise actually stimulates, we know it stimulates neurons to fire, which maybe haven't fired before. Um, so while you're working on these, uh, we get a better better reaction, neuromuscular reaction. But when people stop, a lot of those fibers start to sort of deteriorate again. Well, not deteriorate, but don't fire regularly. And so it's not as easy to get out of bed having had flu and start to get back into a program of exercise. You've got to build it back up, uh, and then it's effective.